It's July 5th, 2021. This is Rook. He is an Iranian-Canadian guitarist and composer who's been influenced by an itinerant youth that had him moving 20 times into five different countries before he was 18. But Mon Ali Jamal has channeled turbulent events in his life, including getting deported from America, into a grounded and inspired sound that mixes genres and sonics on the acoustic guitar. He's widely considered one of the best in his field, has toured around the world as a solo artist, and has a brand new album coming out this month. But first, Mon Ali Jamal. Jamal, the nomadic guitar hero, joins us in the Rook studio. Plus, we have your letters of the week. This is stories from, to, and about the Iranian diaspora. I'm Gian Gomeshi. This is Rook. Hi there, welcome to episode 124 of Rook. Hope you're keeping well wherever you are tuning in from around the world. Hello to you from Toronto, Canada. Salam Dustan Aziz, Dudut Bashama. We are on an ongoing mission to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian diaspora identity. And we're coming to you on rookmedia.com. Rookmedia.com, or if you want to head straight to one of our platforms, Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, and Castbox. If you'd like to see some visuals with Rook, switch over to Instagram or YouTube right now. And if you like your Rook descriptions and bulletins in English and Farsi, check us out on Telegram. All of those places, uh, all of those platforms, the handle is Rook Media. Hello, the fabulous Keon. Hi, Gian. You are ready for tennis again. You <laughs> I'm have always your, ready for I tennis. This is your, your Rook outfit, basically. <laughs> it is, yeah. For, uh, good for the tennis courts and good for the Rook studio. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. well, it's great. It's it works. Sometimes it's a white tennis outfit. Today Sometimes it's a black, it's black tennis. Yeah, yes. yeah. Fabulous. The fabulous Keon. Riveting, right. isn't it? Hello, Captain Reza. <laughs> Hello, sir. Uh, always dressed as a captain with your <laughs> full uniform and insignia. Uh, right. And hello, Groovy Shia. Oh, yes. We have quorum. Everybody here. Uh, Monali Jamal. Do you know what quorum is, no, Shia? No, no. Quorum is like means that we have uh, all the participants are present. Oh, okay. okay. I see. Uh, thank you. C H R O M E. Q. Q U O R U M. Oh, I see. Yeah, yes. I got it. Yeah, thank you. What's the Farsi word for that? Uh, t- it's like jamme mun jamme. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's that's cool. <laughs> jamme mun jamme. It sounds <laughs> like a reggae term. Come on, Japanese reggae. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how, how was the gig the other night? Hey, you know, jamme mun jamme. <laughs> 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 the band is <laughs> doing well. Monali Jamal. <laughs> Monali Jamal. <laughs> <laughs> Monali Jamish Jamie uh, coming up, uh, super guitarist and um, composer, still a young guy and a young master of the acoustic guitar. His he's got quite a backstory. His parents fled after the revolution. They were uh, politically involved and not on the side of Khomeini. Uh, you know, I I feel like with him, I I was looking at some of the correspondence around him and some researching him. I I feel like a lot of Iranians don't know that he's one of us you know i mean he is i feel like he'd be way more celebrated in our in our community in the global iranian community if people knew that he was iranian he's got a big following but they're not necessarily in fact they're not iranians around the world uh so i i hope this can be an introduction i mean i know he's done some other interviews with the iranian community and and some podcasts and things like that but uh hope this can be an introduction to a lot of people around the world and in particular in iran who are listening who are going to love this guy right yeah definitely yeah he could be in Dang Show. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, he's, he's probably too good to be in Dang Show, but <laughs> no, I be, kid. I mean, no, but uh, be based on the music he's playing, he could be very huge in Iran. That's what I thought. You know, I was saying this to you before the show, that I feel like 
Mona Lee, he's I mean, maybe I'll talk to him about this in the interview. I feel like he's the irony of him not being known by the Iranian community necessarily is that he's playing the kind of music, this beautiful acoustic guitar music that sort of uh, switches in different genres. It's not really one you can't pinpoint what he does, yeah. but um, and some of it's really amazing, you know speedy kind of uh, uh, jazz riffs and things and some of it's just beautiful kind of soft playing but but I feel like it's exactly the kind of music that Iranians would love yes. right I mean yes. certain Iranians yeah. right I looked him up I was looking him up because yeah. just like as Gian said I was curious I'm like how come hi I've never heard of him yeah. this guy is Iranian his name too isn't very I, like, I was gonna say he's got a very unique name I've never heard Mona mm-hmm. Lee and then uh, his look is also he can he can look very uh, mixed racial and like he can he can pass as uh, South American as anything really yeah. Italian Greek so you can't tell by just looking at him he's very handsome handsome guy is that handsome a threat guy. to you Reza? <laughs> it can be a threat so we'll see uh, you <laughs> uh hey listen a shout out to farid Ameriun. farid Ameriun and york national realty uh york national realty is based out of aurora ontario canada you know aurora you probably yeah, play tennis it's, up there. It's quite far out. No, I, I don't spend much time there. But <laughs> sure, not, yes, I'm aware of thank it. Thank you. Now you've also alienated. Add this to the list of people that, <laughs> sh- that <laughs> Keon alienates. That she hates. In one sentence. Wow, I would never go up there. <laughs> it's not too far north of Toronto. It's no. actually a beautiful place it these days. Beautiful. It is. I had a bad relationship with Aurora when I was a kid. Oh, really? What yeah, happened? Because what did I, she do to you? You know, you go for your driver's license. Uh-huh. I failed twice. You yeah. failed your driver's and license twice? Is, yeah. What happened? And the first time I got beaten up after I... Come I, on. No, it's a true story. Are it's a very sad sorry? story, though. I don't want to... I, have I never told you this no, story? No, why don't you tell oh, us? Oh, it's a terrible story. Come on. Uh, and, I, and it's a blight on Aurora. I, I, sh- I assure you, Aurora is more diverse now. This is back in the day. I was like a 16-year-old. Mm-hmm. As a kid in the 80s, I was very... You know, I wore eyeliner and I had little boots, pointy boots, and I had, you know, sort of new wave kid, yeah, right? I wanted yeah. to be the cure or Bowie or whatever, you know. Yeah. And so, and that's not, that was not the scene in Aurora. <laughs> so I turned up there, and at the time I had uh, orange hair, you know, I had wow. little orange hair, okay. yeah. And, <laughs> you know, oh brown kid, orange hair, you know, uh, big nose, pointy boots. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I go up there and, um, First of all, the whole test was that I wasn't going to tell this story. Right? You want to hear the story? <laughs> yeah, I do. Oh, it's no, it's so horrible. Well, first of all, the test was a disaster. But I always remember it because, and at that time, we had just changed the spelling of my name because um, my parent and my mom thought it would be easier for me if it was J-E-A-N, mm-hmm. which I then switched back in University of J-I-N. But it was J-E-A-N. So, so we were hoping that people would see that and say Gian, but mm-hmm. instead it was Gene. For mm-hmm. some, so I remember the guy that this angry like you know white guy you know i did the the test and and i'm nervously like i thought i did well you know and then i park the car and i, I kind of look over at him hoping that i pass the test and he's like in the guy's just shaking his head oh no. and his like forehead is really red like i remember he had like receding hairline like his forehead is red and he and he, and he was wearing glasses took off the glasses like shaking his head and i'm like um mm, sir what you know and he's like Gene, you know, he's like screams, <laughs> which of course was like, and I'm not going to correct the guy. I'm not going to like, excuse me, that's Gene, Gene, you know. And the funniest thing was, so the reason why the I, I failed because when you're parallel parking, you're supposed to parallel park, which means you park into a spot from going backwards. Mm-hmm. You're supposed to check your mirror mm-hmm. and look behind you, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I checked the mirror, but I didn't look behind. So that's why I failed, oh, by no. not looking behind. But yeah. the funniest thing was, he was like, Gene, you could have hit a dog. Which was weird. Like, he not didn't not say, a, like, not a child or like, yeah. <laughs> you could have hit a dog, you know? And I was like, what? You know, <laughs> what did I, Gene? Yeah, so anyway. Like, <laughs> Wait, so, th- and then he beat you up? No, no, he didn't. No, he didn't beat me up. He didn't beat, oh, this, story. it just gets worse. Oh, it was man. like. Uh, it's a really horrible story. Oh, I don't want to, you know. Okay. But anyway, so at the time, there was like a slip that they would give you, like if you pass, yeah. and a slip they give you if you fail. And yeah. it's different colors. So like mine was like a yellow color or something that meant I failed, right? Oh. So then, uh, Jane, you can take this in and make another appointment, you know. So I kind of, she was mm, okay, <laughs> like, you know. keeps saying Jean. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's like, don't have to keep saying says, my name, dude. He keeps, <laughs> saying, keeps saying Jean. You could have hit a dog. You know? <laughs> so anyway, so I go into the place... And then I have to line up 
to make another Girl appointment, clip. right? <laughs> and there's like a, a bunch of kids, like good looking, you know, white kid, you know, yeah. perfect hair, whatever, yeah. lined up in the we just passed line. Yeah. And then I'm there with my yellow slip, Aww. and they're like giggling and pointing Aww. at me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so then my mom my mom was going to pick me up yeah. so I go out uh, onto the street onto Young Street which yeah. is you know Aurora and Aurora this is like 30 years ago Aurora yeah. it's not developed the same way it is now you know yeah. so I go out there you know Aww. and I've got my little yellow slip like I've failed you know yeah. and um, I'm waiting there you know, with pointy boots and little <laughs> you know do wave like skinny kid you know and these kids these like guys who are like you know, 18 or something like two, two, yeah. like two years older, you know, um, with Led Zeppelin shirts on, you know, Led okay. Zeppelin. And and at the time, you were either like a punk new wave kid or you were a rocker, right? Yeah. And so they were rockers. Like, so it was like, uh-oh, trouble, you know? And they had <laughs> and they had like worker Shoot. boots on and Led Zeppelin shirt. And, you know, they kind of spotted me and they're like, hey, you know, and they call me all kinds of names Aww. and yell at me and using homophobic slurs and all this stuff. And so they come over and they like, beat me up wow. <laughs> like they, they knocked me over and kicked me and everything Aww. yeah so then <laughs> with my <laughs> with my yellow oh, slip I mean it's <laughs> terrible right so then um, they they go off and my mom turns up you know and I'm mm, okay. I can wipe myself off yeah. but I I've got and I'm I'm crying a little bit you know Aww. and so my uh, like but I, I try not to you know and so yeah. my mom comes and she gets out of the car and she's holding the keys huh come on you want to drive like <laughs> thinking I had passed yeah. you know and I'm like oh. no I don't want to drive oh, you know? so oh. so then I get in the car you know and uh, on the passenger side like I'm not you're gonna yeah. drive you know I'm giving up you know and so my mom starts driving us back to Thornhill like down Young Street yeah. and I like I've just been beaten up right like yeah. by the big kids and so I start to cry you know I'm like mm, like a whimper and then my mom pulls over the car and goes enough <laughs> You, oh so you God. failed your license, right? <laughs> like, oh why are God. you crying? <laughs> oh, my God. I, I love Persian parents. Oh, like, my God. Man so, up. so, exactly. And I didn't tell her. Like, I had just yeah. been, like, you know, yeah, yeah. bashed, you know. So, I, uh, so anyway, oh, that was it. That's, That's my story about Aurora. Uh, the only part that is missing is for that guy who... who the, the, the Gene guy to come back and be like, Gene, I told you to look back. In. <laughs> but then I went back to Aurora finally, like two times later, and got it. Yeah, I had to two conquer. Times later, wow. I think I failed one more time. Yeah, oh my God, <laughs> I failed at least twice. Are Never you, are you sure you but back, back in the day, in the eighties, you you know, a lot of people failed things. I mean, it wasn't like a now where they just hand these things out to people like Reza. You know, like patient <laughs> trophies and driver's See, that's licenses. right, that's right. You had to, you know, Gene, you could have hit a dog. <laughs> oh, Gene. So Oh, yeah, it was terrible, uh, man. I wish I was there that they can they could beat us together. Oh, oh did you get beaten up too when you were? You kid? know what's funny? It does, he doesn't say, "I wish I was there. I would protect you. I would beat them up for you." Yeah, he said. Oh, yeah. He says, I, I, "I wish I was there. We would get beaten up together." <laughs> we yeah. would get beaten I think up we together. would actually. So I got a sense of shy and I, kind of artsy <laughs> kids, you know, getting nice. beaten up by the rockers. Yeah, it saddens me. Uh, terrible. Of course, later on, I become a big Led Zeppelin fan. Yeah. But you know, those guys. So now, time. if you go to Aurora, <laughs> that's right. Nobody will beat you up. <laughs> Listen, Gene, you've done great. <laughs> you've come a long way. Gene! Uh, poor Farid de Marion, who's now <laughs> yeah, uh, associated <laughs> with this. Like, uh, York National Realty has nothing to do with me getting beaten up in the 80s as a kid in Aurora. Um, so this is a boutique real estate brokerage company that provides top tier service um, from first time home buyers to investors looking for new opportunities in the communities they serve. Uh, you know, Farid has also made it his mission to give back to the Iranian community in the diaspora, supported a number of Persian community events and projects. And this episode of Rook is brought to you with some support from he and his team. A big thank you to Farid Amerion and York National Realty, that team for all that they do. Go to York National com for more information york national.com by the way the episode hasn't begun this is a, <laughs> like what are we for, uh, an hour into the show uh, poor mona lee <laughs> mona lee jamal is not in coming into the now. studio he's like reza check check and see if he's still I out did, there actually yeah, he walked in and he's quite handsome so yes yeah, yeah. he's, he's a threat. jealous now yeah. um <laughs> if you want to become a patron of this program, go to rookmedia.com and uh, press the support us button. 
we do this by uh, crowdsourcing, uh, and so every little uh, bit counts. Five dollars, ten dollars a month uh, really helps us become a patron, become part of the team. Rook at RookMedia.com. We really appreciate it. Um, we have some good letters this week, don't yeah, we? Yeah, yeah, it's a good week in letters. Um, it's from the Dr. Shahi Nuri episode of uh, the Need for Persian Blood. So That's it's, right. it raised a lot of awareness, which is, I hope so. which is the whole point of that episode. So. All right, well, we'll get to that. The Fabulous Keon, Captain Reza, Groovy Shai, we'll get to all of that after our feature guest. Our feature guest today is an Iranian-Canadian guitarist who was named one of the world's top 30 guitarists under 30 by Acoustic Guitar Magazine just a couple years back and has won countless music competitions around the world, including placing first at Canada's Sound Clash Music Awards. Take a listen to this. From his 2009 album, The Ziur Movement. That's the sound of Mon Eli Jamal and an original piece called Movement 3, Ziur. Mon Eli Jamal was born in Iran. He has lived in five different countries, Iran, Belarus, Germany, USA, and Canada, and had moved 20 times by the time he was 18. He has used that nomadic lifestyle as a source of inspiration for his music, and Mon Ali has a number of musical styles. He's able to seamlessly incorporate jazz, funk, flamenco, classical, and Persian ideas into his original compositions, but there aren't many players in finger stylist work that are as impressive as Mon Ali, both technically and musically. He's recorded a number of stellar records and has also been teaching guitar for over 15 years. He's performed on five continents and 17 countries as a soloist and has a signature model acoustic guitar named after him. His latest album, Beauty of Flow, comes out on July 16th. But first, right now, Mon Ali Jamal joins me live in the Rook studio. <laughs> Hello, sir. How you doing? <laughs> really nice to have you here. Thanks for having me. I love that you were miming your own song. <laughs> I was, yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 as you listen back to that, do you normally do that? In my head, more likely. But I mean, I didn't realize what you're going to play. So I was like, okay, I know this piece. <laughs> you remember that one? I remember that one. Now, yeah. you didn't bring your guitar. I didn't. I apologize. <laughs> and I, I've been, as I've been researching, I've been seeing interviews you've done in the past where you usually have your guitar. Right. So, yeah, Camille Luska, the chord. Exactly. You were like, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Forget it. For you guys, I just want a straight yeah, interview. Exactly. I don't want to have to. I don't want to be a performing exactly. monkey. Exactly. Right? No. Yeah. I'm not. Yeah. There's enough content online that you could borrow from. <laughs> uh, this song, uh, Ziur. Mm. This is about an ex of yours. That's right. Yeah. Um, tell. tell <laughs> t why are you laughing? Well, it's uh, it's funny because it's like every album that I do has a concept behind it. Yes. And That that specific one was when I was that was my first love uh, of my life with her. She was a. Uh, a woman in Texas, and we did long distance, so it was a really emotional. She was your fiance. Time. She I was, think, yeah, yeah, exactly. At one point, she was my fiance as well. I think it was after this. Um, yeah, it was a very like you know when when you go through your first love. I think in life, um, it's like it's so powerful and it's so lingering that you want to give everything to that person. And so my homage to her was to make a CD dedicated to her. And so it's like a four part movement series about the love life of my love life with, with her and the ups and downs. That so you had. were still with her? When yeah. You, oh, okay. Because I had read somewhere that this was about your ex-fiance. So I, could, I couldn't tell if this was a lament for the end of the relationship no, or something. No, it was during, yeah. This was, <laughs> still could be a lament, but it was yes, during the relationship. exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's interesting because, as you say, you often have moments in your life where people that become the inspiration for the pieces you write. Now, mm -hmm. I'm always... Uh, that's not uh, exceptional or that's not a, a surprise in yeah. instrumental music. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, Fur Elise, you know, there's great pieces of yeah. classical music that were written with somebody in mind or about a, a, an event or something. Yeah. But as 
someone who thinks of songwriting more in the lyrical form you mm-hmm. know uh, if I go through a breakup I want to write the lyrics I don't necessarily write a melody yeah. how does it take form when you're making instrumental music so you're in love with Ziur or you're in this <laughs> relationship how, how does that translate into your fingers I think a lot of it is um, it's like metaphysical it's not even a thing that I can really describe other than the fact that the emotions that I have come out through me not usually through words but mm-hmm. through abstract ways and that's just always how, how, I've, how I've been taught even with my parents being uh, both musicians and artists just our whole lives we've been able to or just thought that this was a normal way to do that to translate or transmute what's going on in life through your art mm-hmm. so I'm very lucky because I've had parents and, and three older brothers who kind of all just nourish that with with to each other um, as far as like how the story comes about I don't really know it's not really something that I can like it's not tangible it's not something that I can just grasp and like that's how we do it and I will say every song that I write has multiple meanings I just happened to give it that specific meaning at the time because it was relevant mm. so and that's that's I think the confusing part for a lot of people like how do you come up with that one idea for that one song it's just again it's that that one idea that I put to it but I can guarantee you there's been multiple aspects of that like in my life emotionally mm. that I have contributed to it it's just at the end result I present it as this one story. But it's a, it's a very was, romantic notion that yeah. you're speaking through your playing through your music yeah yeah I think th- I think that that's part of being an instrumental an instrumental player I think the absence of words allows the listener to create their own world now, even when I play shows and live and stuff like that, I'm usually telling stories about and banter, you know, about the songs because for a lot of people who can't, uh, aren't good at imagining things, it gives them a little bit of a baseline mm. to base it off. I was like, okay, so this song is about a, a love interest that he had. So let me try to think back as a listener about my love interest. You know, it's very relatable. So you're providing a libretto almost, like yeah, a, like a, like you would at the ballet. This exactly. is what that's what's happening here. Yeah, and that's pr- because there aren't lyrics in a lot of cases. Exactly. When the song is about someone or about, do, will it always be that in your mind? Like when that, when you heard a, that song, that those first few notes and went, oh, they picked this song. <laughs> do, do you go back to Zero and then do you, it is like, I can't believe the time she cheated on me. And like, <laughs> do you feel those emotions again? Or? No, not no. at all. It's, I'm pretty removed from it. It's when I play it live that yes, I do. That's how I visualize. I do, I'm a very visual person, even though I'm a like musician, which is very auditory. Uh, my first like way of learning and communicating is very visual based. Mm. So if the music doesn't create a visual sense in my mind, it's very difficult for me to finish a song. So, and I also have synesthesia, which is that when that one of the senses gets triggered by another sense. So for example, when I play music, I start to see things in my, in my mind. Sorry, in my what's head. it called? Synesthesia. Wow, yeah. synesthesia. Synesthesia, yeah. yeah. So it's it's when one, one sensory... I think there's a vaccine triggers. for that. I'm yeah, sure. I think you got it. <laughs> no, just, yeah. Yeah. It's when one, one sense triggers another sense? Exactly. So it could be through smell, for example. When you smell something, you know, some, some people can see can see something or even hear music. It, it can be... I don't think it's it's just exclusive Some people, like, don't, don't we do... It's not every, us do that? No, no. Do we? I, I don't know. Well, I, 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 as far as I know, I don't think that everyone has, has it in the same way because uh-huh. some people will listen to music and then see visuals like abstract lines forming or something and and I used to think that this was just normal until I, I, someone told me about it when I explained my compositional process I'm like oh that's synesthesia it's like I looked it up it's like wow okay that's true then I asked other musicians and stuff and some of them said yeah I have that mm-hmm. great musicians have it I think because I think that's just how they draw their inspiration mm. from and being able to visualize it or to translate it into another f- sense because mm-hmm. music is so visual, I mean, so auditory. But I think it's when you, a lot of people listen to music are usually taken away or, or taken to a memory. That's a very mm-hmm. common experience for a lot of people. Yes, yes, right? yes. That just happened to me oh. <laughs> yesterday where something, as it does, now that we put things on random, you know, or whatever, yeah. a song came up that I hadn't heard for about, uh, for, for many years. And it really took me, in fact, it took me back specifically to sitting on a couch crying wow. 20 years ago. Yeah. Oh my God. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, so music, to, I mean, it can definitely do that. So do, you're, you're saying that you see See things, yeah, yeah. Is it, is it always the trip. same thing? You no, see? no. It's and it, that that that's the interesting thing is like when it, if I do play a song like that, like Zyre or something that I've played a million times. Oh, it's Zyre. Uh, Zyre. Sorry. It's okay. It's, okay. Your, it's it's a made up word, so it doesn't. It's. Oh. Uh, <laughs> It's, uh, if I you, thought it was her name backwards. It is. It is. So what's her name? 
Ru- Ruiz. Well, is, Ruiz is Ruiz. Zier then, not, yeah, not Z- Zier. Zier sounds better. <laughs> <laughs> Zier okay. or Zier, yeah, I don't know. Zier, it just it's more English, you know. It's, yes, it just rolls yes, off yeah. the tongue. But yeah, I think it's just it's it's the process of of um, whenever whenever I play something, um, if it takes me to a visual world, uh, a fantasy world, that's usually when I'm most engulfed in it, and that's when usually I know I've got something that mm. I want to share with the world. So is it almost like? Um, like at a live concert are you like are you almost tripping you know yeah the, the audience will see you kind of like a, a like a sufi a kind of a, yeah it's a trance a, you're a trance yeah you'll go into a kind of state yeah totally wow. yeah it's it's no different I, it's, I mean i i don't really know how they enter the trance other than just twirling around a million times and i don't know how they're not dizzy um but it would be the same thing for me i'm just moving my hands and my, my fingers just kind of act on on their own and I do close my eyes a lot when I'm playing live, especially because I I can't I can't be like oh my god there's an audience in front of me mm. and I'll, I'll freak out and like oh my god you're wrong notes. Um, so I'm very aware of like it's almost like a transcending experience as you know mm. as a musician yourself mm-hmm. you know like what, one of the reasons we play music or listen to music is to transcend. Mm-hmm. That's the ultimate goal anyway. So mm-hmm. so whenever I write pieces like that that make me transcend, I just hope that it translates you know accurately to the listener as well you you're such a you talk about your fingers moving you're such a a monster player man i mean you're a great player mm, uh, wh- what what does finger style mean finger style some people would argue it's 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 a genre uh but it's also a, a technique basically it's like taking flamenco classical country finger picking uh jazz and fusing it all together but traditional finger style, you're thinking of Boom Chick, which is like Chet Atkins or Merle Travis. Um, and those were the pioneers at the time, which was very American. That's American uh, blues or, or country mm, kind of? Similar. But so, so typically, the, the, the whole point of finger style, traditionally, when we think of traditional finger style, is that you got the bass line. You do, 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 uh-huh, do, with your thumb. With your thumb, exactly. Yeah. And then you got the melody going on with the other fingers. And usually you're muting the bass notes to have more separation uh, sonically from the bass, from the, the melody. So it really sounds like multiple instruments. Even just that alone can sound like two instruments. So you never use a pick. I use a thumb pick actually. So, but but oh, I, I do okay. have nails, and you can kind of see here. Yeah. I, I have acrylic gel nails on top of my real nail. So on, on my fingers and my thumb, I usually use a thumb pick because that thumb pick allows me to get a little bit more clarity of uh-huh. the bass note. Are your fingers? Are your nails insured? They are not. Have you got to I that sh- point <laughs> yet where it's like a? I, I need to look into that. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, you lose a finger. And, yeah. Uh, uh, what you do is also very percussive. Mm-hmm. Like there's moments, it's really fun watching you play or, and listening to you play. You mm-hmm. don't even need to watch you play. You can hear it mm-hmm. because you're using the fingers. And then sometimes you'll use pieces of the body of the guitar That's to right. make sounds. I want to play a, a, a bit uh, of something from a, a track on your 2012 record called The Lamage Movement. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a bit uh, called, do you, do you know which one it is? Awakening? Nope. If I'm talking about percussive. Okay. Nine year residence. It could be uh, on the run. It's called Six in Harmony. Six in Harmony. Okay. Yeah. Take a listen to (laughs) this. Jamal and a piece called Six in Harmony a little taste of it at least see I love that piece mm. uh, all of those sounds are being made by the guitar that's right yeah and h- how many overdubs is that how many versions of you is that to- six so so the, the the idea the concept of this song was that there's six family members in my in my family mm. so every one of them is one instrument 
And because this was this whole CD Lamage movement was about my parents' journey and struggle coming from Iran all the way yes. to Canada. And so this piece in particular was about the experience of us coming from America to Canada because I was kicked out of America. Long story. But, but and then when we came to, to Canada, it was a very testing time for us that we all had to kind of harmonize with each other if we're going to survive this. Huh. So that was, the, uh, that was that song. So does each sound represent a, a Fa- person? A family member, yeah, exactly. Uh-huh. So who gets to be the baby? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably my dad. <laughs> Who's the sweet melody? Yeah, yeah. Right? Me, yeah. of course. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's a beautiful piece, uh, and, and, and it's so innovative in terms of what you're doing. You, you, your family... Uh, let's talk about that since mm-hmm. you've, you've brought them up. You come from a family of artists. Mm-hmm. Uh, was it always obvious that your path has to be an artistic one? Um, yeah, actually. Because, I mean, I'm also the youngest of four boys, so constantly there was art around. And plus, I had three older brothers who were always doing art, being forced to do it by my parents, and eventually it was me on me. Um, but just having five people who were always better than me artistically hmm. was one of the best things for me because it allowed me to see the the level that that is around me and plus you know you know like when you're speaking a language if you if you if you've got masters of the english language like when you're a toddler and you got two parents speaking english they're masters of the language of speaking it sure imagine those parents also were masters of art mm. or of music so naturally that's you're going to pick that up that gene that's inside you that may be dormant awakens and then it's unstoppable at that point. And that's what, how I like to relate to it because it, I think it was some, maybe it was a gene that I had from them or if it was just also my environment because that plays a huge role too. I had the right environment too because there was a lot of adversity. So we needed to let that adversity out somehow. And it wasn't through speaking ever. We didn't really talk about our emotions. It was really done through an artistic expression. What kind of artists were they? Because I know that they were painters Both and, of them and musicians. Painters and, and musicians, yeah. And my grandfather as well, he's pretty well known. Uh, he was a well-known writer in Iran, um, Behazin. He was, I think, the first person to translate Shakespeare from, I think, oh, wow. French to, to, to Persian. Yeah. Huh. So your parents... I guess they were somehow they got on the on the on the shit list of the Iranian <laughs> regime. They yeah. were they were not just artists, but they were activists, activist artists. Yeah, very active. How would they express this activism? Like how how, how was it done? Or I mean, what 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 did they do? What were they doing that were they were on the streets? They were handing out flyers. They were in in the uh, two day party, which I think was communists. the communist party. Uh-huh. Exactly. So that are automatically you know you're going to be on the the shit yeah, list. Yes, not a friend <laughs> of the of the. Yeah. Uh, Islamic formalists. So, yeah. w- and you've talked a bit about um, the very difficult times that your dad, in particular, went through mm. uh, under this regime. Uh, yeah. uh, so, this is after the revolution. Mm-hmm. Did they meet before the revolution? My parents. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So they were already together. They were their artists. They're presumably relatively free, doing their thing. Yeah. Revolution happens because you're not around yet. I'm not around. Um, and what happens that ends up getting your father tortured? And right. So it was both of my parents at this point were in France getting their PhD in art um, in the University of Sorbonne in Paris. And then the revolution started to happen and they were really questioning, like, should we stay and do our finish our, our PhD or should we go back and be a part of the revolution? They chose to go back. They mm. chose to drop their studies and, and just go right back to, to in the middle of the hurricane, like just go right into it. And uh, unfortunately, and in the early days of the revolution, everybody thought it might be it might be their revolution exactly. too. So the two day, I thought, okay, this is this There's is going to be a communist uh, yeah. paradise, perhaps. Yeah, exactly. And unfortunately, um, he was too active. He got caught um, along with my grandfather as well, and my uncle as well, and just a whole bunch of members of, of that group. And uh, yeah, they were interrogated, tortured, trying to get information out of them. I think overall, my dad was I think in jail for seven years. Wow. Yeah. How much of that did you know when you were young? Nothing. I, I mean, to be honest, I probably heard about the stories, but I was just a kid. I was in Germany at that point, and right. I was like, I didn't, I was in my own world. They shielded you from that. I Probably, yeah. I mean, I don't have any recollection of them ever talking about it because I was just so young, and, and again, I was just in my own world. And even if they mm-hmm. did talk about it, I was probably just mm-hmm. like off wandering and being a shit disturber. Do, was there a time when they sat you down and said... Uh, uh, this is what happened uh, when we were. No, <laughs> this is why we left. Or, or did you? It, you it, had to it, kind of figure that out yourself. Well, it was more like us just asking questions. Like at, uh, sometimes throughout gatherings, we would get together, and then one person would ask a question, and my dad would go into it. Like my dad's very open. We'll talk uh, like details about right. it, which is great because 
uh, even whenever we meet, there's always new information I'm, I'm learning about his experience and, and how tough that was, not only for him, but for a whole generation that, you know, we're, are sc- is scarred from that. They escape Iran. Uh, you end up in Germany where you mm-hmm. basically spend your first years of, of your life. And you've lived a very nomadic life, mm-hmm. Monali. You've, you've said this has informed your music. Totally. How, yeah. does it, how does it inform your music? I think just being culturally aware of many different, different the way things are. I think I, mean, I was born in Belarus, so going from Belarus to Germany to America to Canada, I think just seeing different cultures and having to learn new languages and seeing how things are done allowed me to see another perspective of life and, and the human nature, which was very interesting and very revealing because, I mean, I was in, in America, I was in Texas, which is so different from Minneapolis, where I was also for two years. So north to south and Canada, it's just so much more liberal here. So just all these different walks of life and then also being able to, to tour the world now um, has been a blessing because I'm able to just understand cultures a little bit more and let that be a, a guide for me, musically mm-hmm, speaking, mm-hmm. especially musically. You know, culture, as you know, music has a big part to do with culture. Um, so going to different places like I don't know, Zimbabwe or, or like um, India, just hearing the musical styles there and trying to mess around with, with those rhythms and yeah. melodies has been really fun. And, and yeah, really, that you know, we're, t- we're talking really about the exploration of keep pushing forward. And that's really And, and do you feel like you absorb that almost totally. like a, a kid who is uh, multilingual yeah. at a young age has a facility for languages that mm. uh, a kid who grew up, grows up unilingual doesn't have exactly yeah that's, that's exactly it I was talking to a, a couple of musical friends uh, recently who are Iranian and I was telling them as mm. a drummer um, I still can't like I can sort of I can play six eight mm-hmm. but I don't <laughs> totally get it yeah. like I don't you know, it's really hard for me to feel it. Yeah. And when I'm playing with Iranian guys who are, who are really steeped in that kind of tradition, they don't get me as I, you know. <laughs> I'm doing like four four, four kind four, of yeah, drumming, exactly. right? Exactly. <laughs> uh, and so I, it's it's really uh, must be really interesting to be able to walk through those different cultural fields. Oh, so much, especially like I grew up with traditional Persian music, so I was blasting. And one side of my ear was Persian, bla- like the traditional uh, Persian music, with my dad playing it. In one room, and in the other room, my mom was there listening to classical Western music. So I was constantly around this fusion of Middle Eastern music meeting the Western music, uh, classical music. And that was a huge, like, inspiration. And Zaire is actually based off of that. Zaire is, is not only about, you know, the, the X, but a big part of it musically, harmonically, is the melting point or the meeting point of the Western world and the Eastern world uh. meeting. So, again, that, that's why I say, like, every song has multiple meanings and yes. multiple, uh, you know, definitions of what I give it but and and that that song in particular was very interesting because it is in six eight it's a six eight yes, feel yes um and I played Ton Buck for like just maybe six months to a year I was kind of really into that and I tried to eventually let that go and try to incorporate some of those rhythmic techniques into the guitar so and I, I have a sitar I have a tar so I just I love the exploration of other instruments and then taking that information or that harmonic you know context and bringing it to the guitar ultimately at the end did you uh speak Persian in the house when you were a kid? Like, what, what was the no. language that your parents spoke to you? Yeah, so they yeah. spoke Persian to us, but we always replied in either German or English. In whatever country you have it. Well, yeah, it would exactly. be German first. Exactly. Because then you come, you move from Germany, uh, and you end up in Texas. Yeah. Uh, you're mm-hmm. a nine-year-old. You can't speak English. Yeah. What was that like for you? Difficult. Um, and that was very outgoing in, in Germany. Um, I was like the class clown. And then if, when it got to America, I was like, oh, my God, I don't even speak the language. I had to go through ESL and learn the language. Um, so it was culture shock, t- just mm-hmm. o- over, over the top. And, and it, it, it was a trauma. It was traumatic for sure, uh, a lingering trauma that thankfully I was able to kind of harness and let out through the music. Uh, well, you've said that in Texas, I mean, because you were playing the violin mm-hmm. when you were a little kid. Yeah. And it was in Texas that you first got really seduced by the guitar. Mm-hmm. How so? Yeah, so, you know, I think I was 16 at the 15, um, and, you know, hormones started kicking in, and I wanted to be cool and uh, and, and break the rules. And, the and violin, there weren't enough violin rock stars. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, there aren't enough. <laughs> exactly. And I wasn't, go- I wasn't about to be one of them. Uh, but there was a guitar at my friend's house. Everyone was playing guitar, and it was just a cool thing to do, as you know, with, I'm sure, your generation. I think we're similar in age, no? Like, uh, no, no, I'm, I'm older than Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Um, but, yeah, so the guitar, even today it still has its its 
its its place. But I think um, it was just a very inspiring place because I was really into metal music, into punk music, um, into pissing people off with my music by like just bringing it, turning it up to eleven, and just playing as loud as I can. An um, electric guitar. Electric guitar. Yeah. So you were you were you playing acoustic at all? I mean, you've no. become this this you know <laughs> one of the great acoustic players of the world. Mm. It's funny you started on electric. Oh yeah. You're the inverse of Dylan. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Dylan yeah. went electric. You went acoustic. Exactly. Right. Yeah, but, I, but but the reason I went to the acoustic was because I got deported from America and came to Canada. Oh, we're gonna get that to that. Was, okay. We're gonna get yeah. to that. Yeah. So <laughs> so so you but you saw some guitar somewhere in Texas on my friend's couch. Yeah, and it was, it was very, your friend's couch. Somewhere was your friend's couch. Yeah. and you start playing and, you, and it feels like home. Well, I, I got one of the guys there to, to to play me like teach me a couple of chords D G and A and then uh, I eventually like one two days later I I had it down which was very like oh okay like maybe I have an aptitude for this. Mm. Um, I think playing violin helped enormously and just watching all, all my three older brothers play guitar i had people around me playing and at a very high level so i was like okay i can and i'm all, i was always like that kind of guy who wanted who saw someone do something and i said i want to do that <laughs> all the time with everything and that pissed people off sometimes because then i would i would do it and i would engulf myself so much into it that the next day when i came up to him was like can you show me some more chords and he's like that's all i know then i started exploring on my own and actually going further into it even more so and then looking and, and we, we weren't really well off so i had to go online um to look for resources and try to learn guitar you weren't uh, really way. well off your dad uh and and i have to put this in the context of as you say the phds mm. sorbonne you know uh artists that who were great at what they do your dad ends up a cab driver That's driving right. a taxi in texas yeah. and i wonder the impact that had on you, um, I, you know, I can remember mm. at times when my dad lost his job, and and yeah. uh, it, it's a really tough thing for a Persian man yes, to exactly. look at his son and yeah. to be trying to deal with, you know, being the role model that he wants to be yeah. and be the breadwinner for the family and all of those things that are imbued and what it means to be a Persian man. Mm -hmm. And um, did it dissuade you at all from wanting to become an artist, seeing that your dad go through that? Or or did you worry mm -hmm. about your future or did you uh, somehow see him in a different way? No, I mean, I had so much respect for him because he was able to to drive cab and then come home after like a 10 hour day to teach music or do do recordings. He was always doing CDs. He was always releasing stuff, doing concerts. Um, and so he was still very active. And that was actually very inspiring for me in retrospect. But at the time, I realized I was so different from my dad musically that I didn't even compare myself to to him because he was doing traditional Persian music and classical music mm. whereas I was doing at that point like emo and punk and you know ska and that that sort of stuff which was really fun and very different from from what he was doing so I and very um, different from what you're currently yeah, doing. exactly yeah I mean that's part of evolution evolution yeah. as, as yeah. a person as, as, a, as an artist I think because um, if you start if you just start doing if you just do the whole thing over and over again you're gonna plateau very quickly and you're gonna you know there needs to be growth whatever that may be for you but doing a new instrument and i just started playing piano too just to kind of push myself out of mm. the, the guitar world and it's it's showing me a whole new side of of music that i didn't uh, discover before which is very very encouraging so but yeah it sounded like um from from the sounds of it uh you tell me but that you had a pretty good thing going on in austin at that point as yeah. a teenager you're playing music uh, you feel you're starting to, to learn who you are. Mm -hmm. Things are falling into place. Yeah, yeah. and then 9/11 happens. Yeah, and in 2003, what happens? So we got a deportation letter. Now the thing is, when we were in America, we were there for nine years, and but our status was just pending. We, so we weren't either. We weren't citizens. We weren't. Uh, you're, you weren't refugees. We weren't refugees. We we're pending immigrants. And so oh. for nine years, because uh, our case that, that we had in 2000, uh, sorry, 1996, I think, when we first came, uh, it wasn't strong enough because our lawyer said that we had proof of something happening in Germany. Uh, long story short, the, the judge said, show me this video. The lawyer lied. He, he didn't have a video. So then he just said, well, I'm sorry, you're just going to be pending for the next uh, okay. uh, until perpetuity, I guess. Um, and then 9-11 happened. And then the Act, Homeland Security Act, got yeah. passed that said. A Patriot Act. Exactly. Yeah. Anyone within certain countries, which was Afghanistan, Pakistan, just a whole bunch of countries, Iran included, uh, if they didn't have citizenship, that they would need to be, uh, they would need to leave the country. So we actually got this letter in the mail um, that said we had 30 days to leave the country voluntarily or be deported which was just like, holy crap, like we, we're, 
paying taxes like Americans. We're we're mm-hmm. now speaking like Americans. Mm-hmm. We have a house. We're working. We're you know we're, we identify as the, as mm-hmm. as an as an American. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was like the hardest thing by far to just sell all of our things, um, all of our paintings, all of our instruments, because we had so many, because there were six of us at that point, we all played many different instruments, sell everything that we had and just make the trek up north hoping that Canada would, would even accept us. So we didn't, there was just, again, more limbo on that travel. Meaning that you was, drive to Canada. Yeah. And so, Wow. And yeah. you say, can can will you let us in? Yeah. Will you let us be live here? We had we had a, we had a case, so we, we you know we, we gave them our case, and, and thankfully they said, okay, um, at the border, like we will accept you, and then wait for the hearing, and then you'll talk to the judge and see what they say. I mean that for a kid who was born in Belarus has got to feel even if they don't sit down and tell you about it, <laughs> feel what his parents have gone through, mm-hmm. knows that he's Iranian. Yeah. Then starts to get settled in Germany only to pick up and go. Mm-hmm. And even then, your parents didn't really tell you what you were doing when you went to the States. You thought you were That's going right. on holiday That's or something, right? right? Exactly. <laughs> you go to the States. Then just when you feel like, okay, now I fi- I'm figuring out who I am, mm-hmm. you, you're you getting kicked out of a country. Yeah. Again, were you angry? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was by far my my darkest, you know, the, the the dark night of the soul kind of experience. And I was suicidal. I was depressed. I was looking for any. I was. I felt like I was in prison because the first six months that I was here in Canada, I couldn't go to school. I had to do my last year of high school, and then because it was a semester school. So where I came did you in move to? Toronto. Toronto. Yeah, yeah, yeah like Will- Willowdale, not too far from here. So. Um, yeah, and so I, I I had to wait six months before going to high school. And so in those six months, I felt like I just locked myself in my room. I didn't know anybody. I just I played guitar. That's when the acoustic guitar started to emerge, and I was like, oh my god, this feels so good. Um, and then I was really into drawings. So I'm very very into drawing as well at the time. And then I was really into push ups. So I felt like I was in prison. It really felt like I was I was in. It really I like I, I it was a self the push ups part really does. <laughs> yeah. You go out to the courtyard for an yeah, hour exactly. and go back into the room. Yeah, but uh, not to make light of it. That yeah. is a it, no, it is <laughs> it's horrible. It's horrible uh, in terms of. What that and and how were your parents dealing with this? I think we all of us were just um, a ticking time bomb. All of us were. I mean, my parents were the most stoic out of all of us. Not that Toronto is a bad place to go to. Of course, but, no, uh, but that uh, just honestly, at that, this point, my parents were used to getting tossed around and 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 being kicked out. My my, my they were upset. Yes, but. They had no choice, so you know part of that st- stoic philosophy is like going back to Iran's not an option. Absolutely not. And what about Germany? That if we had left, um, if it's if you're gone for more than six years, you lose your res- residency uh-huh. at, at the time. So we were there for nine years. So yeah, and Ger- we we even called Germany. Germany was like, we're gonna just send you back to Iran. So and we're like, holy crap. Okay, so this is. Danger. We thought about going down to Mexico and becoming drug cartels, but uh, that, that never ended. <laughs> the entire uh, cartel. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, see, right? The Persian, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, this thing where you lock yourself in the bedroom and you're playing it. By, by the way, something about your dad gets you an acoustic guitar, or mm-hmm. there's some pivotal guitar that ends up becoming your companion when you moved yeah. to Canada, right? It was just about maybe two months before we got the, the, let, the, the, the deportation letter that I got an acoustic guitar. It was a black acoustic guitar, hundred dollars off of eBay. Really cheap guitar, but I, I, I started to feel in love, and that's that was my my the catalyst of like getting into finger picking and getting into classical music and getting a little bit more into flamenco. But it was also your salvation. Right like yes. this this guitar yeah. becomes your escape. It, it really was. And yeah. we often use that language, like we talk mm-hmm. about art being or you know something or other sports. You know, people that yeah. was my escape. That was my salvation. Yeah. But in your case. It it really sounds like it saved you. A hundred percent. I wouldn't be here right now if it wasn't for art and music. I would have been dead. I would have killed myself, hands down. Like that's it, it's, and I can say it so freely because uh, I know where I am today. I'm in a much better, healthier place. I've mm-hmm. I've done a lot of work on myself and, and try to grow as much as I can. You haven't stopped doing the push-ups by the look of it. <laughs> yeah, right. It's like yeah. <laughs> interviewing Mr. T. That's right. A, that's yeah. a reference you'll have to look up. Since I know. I'm I know. Ten T. years yeah. older than you. Okay. <laughs> I know. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but I, I think I mean I mean it's it's all mindset. All right. And if I didn't go through that, I wouldn't be who I am today. And, and I'm glad I went through it. As hard as it was, I'm really glad that adversity went huh. that I went through. I w- and honestly, if I could go back to it, I would redo it because I know what that would do today. 
I, I, I deep deep down, like I. So, what uh, would you say is the greatest lesson you learned from that that kind of adversity? That everything that happens in your life is there's a there's a greater purpose for it later on in your life that you just don't understand mm-hmm. right now. That's that's the, the easiest way I can, and, and it also romanticizes the experience, the hardship that you have today. All right, it's maybe a more of an ideal outlook, but I, I will say, whenever I've looked at life or adversity like this, I know that later on in life, I'm like, that's why that happened. That's why I got kicked out. I got kicked out so I could spread the message of, of my music. Or, because right now, a lot of my music, yeah, it's not just about the music, it's about the stories of the music too, that, I, that, that there's more lessons in it, you know, that I want to convey through the music. It's, it's tra- now, tra- I I'm, I'm feel like I'm, I'm, I'm reaching or trying to transcend as much as I can. Speaking of the stories, <laughs> um, you do find where you belong. And that is underscored in an official capacity. Mm-hmm. I want to play a, a song. This I play a little bit of a, a t- shy. I play a taste of "Most Glorious Day." Mm-hmm. This is Monali Jamal. Eight called Most Glorious Day. Well, you saw where I was going with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> tell, tell people who are listening what the relevance of that song is. Yeah, that's a, a very powerful song for me. Um, that, that was the song that, uh, that's dedicated to me becoming a Canadian citizen. And uh, I forgot what year it was that I was, became a citizen. I think 2006, 2007 or so. Um, and that was the first time that I got 2008, citizen. 2008, I think. Well, that's, that's when I wrote the song. Or oh. was it 2008? I don't know. Didn't, didn't you write the song right away when you got I that, did. the day you went to the citizenship? See, you know better. Why You're, do I know <laughs> your story better than <laughs> yeah. yours? What's going on here? I, I'm very forward thinking. I don't think about the past too much. So, so I know uh, how to spell your ex or say your <laughs> yeah, ex-fiance's anyway. name. Yeah. I mean, yeah. What else do you know about me? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's it's a very powerful song because it's, uh, it's when I got my citizenship. I felt so inspired finally that I, 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 I felt like I belonged to a country. Uh, and my whole life, up to up to when I was 23 years old, when I wrote 22, um, I didn't feel, feel like I belonged in America. I, I was always like an outsider in Germany, an outsider Belarus. Everywhere I went, I, I didn't belong. I felt like part of me didn't fully belong, even though I speak like like a North American. Um, you know, visually, there's something different. I look different than other people. Than than you know. So that song was so powerful because that gave me the sense of like this is home. Like I finally mm. reached home after all these years. And, and also with for my parents who've just struggled so far, so much. I mean, it's like my story times times three with what they've been through and finally come to Canada, all of us, to Did have you all become haven. citizens at the same yeah. time? Yeah. That's so cute. Yeah, it's you adorable, all, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, did, you, yeah. you, did you go to like Swiss Chalet or KFC that night? <laughs> what did we like, do? Let's yeah, celebrate. Yeah, yeah. Here Let's go to a Canadian. It's my version of, of yeah, celebrating. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Probably Swiss Chalet, I guess. Yeah, if, if you try to keep the Canadian. You thing. got some uh, beer. Yeah. And, uh, you know, all right, we, kids, let's go. <laughs> took some shots of maple syrup <laughs> and we're good to go. Yeah. Yeah. It was a really, really powerful song. It's such a happy song as you can see. It's well, like the song really, I, I picked that one because when I heard the story of it, I thought, man, that really communicates mm. what it's, that sounds like my uh, most glorious day. Yeah. You, you, you know, you nailed it. Um, oh. The the album that you make just a few years after that, 2012, that you mm-hmm. you've talked about a little earlier, this is really moving. It's mm. This is the Limage movement, mm-hmm. which is, again, this is the reversal of that, says exactly. Jamal, which is your last name. This mm-hmm. is an homage to your dad. Exactly. Yeah. Why did you want to make an album about your dad? Just, again, when we talked about him going to prison and, and um, fighting for a country, like that, for a lot of like my generation now, it's, it's, it's like, wow, like you actually would drop everything and go be a part of a revolution. That's... That's kind of unheard of. I, I don't have a lot of people around me who, who would do something like that. Sure, we protest here all the time in Toronto, but let, to actively go out and like... Um, put your life on the put line. Put your life on... Yeah, exactly. That That is like... That's real That's real protesting right there. That's like you could die from this. Here, it's all like safe and you're, you're fine. You're just freedom of speech. 
but in Iran, that's not the case. Like, y- if you say something wrong, if you believe in, in, a, fa- in a faith that's not in, in line with theirs, you're going to jail or be tortured or, or something will happen to you. Um, and I, I felt I needed to, to send this message of, like, my, my parents' journey and what they've been through. And even the first song off of that album, Awakening, is about mm. his journey um, when he was in jail. And he realized, like, because they were giving him books on Islam to try to convert him. They also give him books on Marxism, try to like convince him how stupid that is. But he actually went more, even more into it uh, because of that. So that's that was very interesting for me just to, to hear his stories and uh, go deeper into it. And so again, the whole concept album is is an homage to kind of our, our journey. What was it like for him to hear this record and to see his son putting this out? He's very proud. He's very very proud of that. I think. Um, because we talked about it and and yeah it's it's very it's it's cool i think for him to have like mm. his offspring uh, share music that's that's based off of something that he's been through personally and you know nothing but respect for him and and he's you know he's still active in the art world he's still painting all the time and has purpose for life and i think that's that's the most beautiful thing because he's 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 80 now so it's like that and still doing well, you and still an old, you have an old dad yeah he, for, he's I, 44 years older than you yeah yeah oh. so he he was 44 when when he had me which is late are your other siblings musicians as well we all were at one point yeah uh-huh. yeah right now it's just and are they angry that you've had so much success <laughs> i don't know actually i, I think that i want to hope that they're proud of me but uh I, because when we're all doing our own things now so right. it's it's all it's all different but um, yeah, some of them obviously express it more than others uh, in, in my family with, with kind of where I've come. And obviously me being the youngest might have something, another aspect of it that like, you know, you would think that the older siblings are more successful. I don't know. It's just a traditional mindset. That I want to play a piece from that record from 2012. Um, there's a Pink Floyd song called Us and Them. Yeah. This is us <laughs> against them. Again, yeah, right. Uh, what can you tell us about this? Yeah, so this was about um, us can also stand for the U.S., so, but it was us, my family, against them, which was the, the the U.S. government that kicked us out. So the whole story of that is us realizing that we now have to go. Like this is our goodbye to America, and we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know if we we could potentially come, ever come back to America because I had a ten year bar from, from the states after we left. With another crazy long story, but um, and so us against them is about the journey of us having to fight them, which was America. <laughs> Jamal. This one from the album The Lamage Movement from 2012 and the song Us Against Them. When you play gigs, are you usually solo? Yeah. I've seen you with some strings, but that I guess that was a special occasion. That was in Reunion Island, yeah, for a one-time gig. So th- it, it's it, you're like a you're a comedian. It's just you up on stage by yourself. <laughs> yeah. But that's pretty good for business, too. It's, you, you don't it's, have to pay a band. Exactly. You don't have to it's very load in a bunch of equipment. It's the easiest. And I, I, that's, to be honest, it's, I found a system that worked for touring, and it, it was very effective. And I know it's like it's a lot of pressure on me to be on stage alone. And not only that, but I'm not singing. I'm just playing guitar, so I, my chops better be good um, to kind of captivate the audience. Because you know, part of that is um, emotive. Part of it is very percussive, and that percussive style translates really well on stage because it's such a visual thing. And when you're looking at it as, as an audience member, you're thinking, "There's got to be another guitar there. There's, like, there's got to be like a backing track." I always get asked that, like, "Where is, is there a backing track for that song?" And, but then now I feel like I have to like announce it before I start. Like by the way, everything is just one guitar, you know, just just to kind of preempt them a little bit for the the experience that that will come. What percentage of that? I'm going to get into who your audience is in a second, but mm. just in terms of uh, the muso part of it, how how many of 
the people do you get the sense that really follow you are guitarists and how many are just fans of your music that would normally turn up at gigs it's pretty mixed um, when i was first starting out it was just like a because it was very percussive way back like 2006 right yeah. um and that was very like captivating everyone was like whoa but the, the problem for me was that i wasn't hitting their hearts i was hitting their their minds and like the right. wow factor right. but i wasn't hitting their hearts and, right. I, and i learned that and and i realized there, there needed to be a shift because i was just like what am i doing all this technical stuff gymnastics for then it, it like now i'm not doing very much technical stuff at all it's very emotive it's very melodic it's very like easier to understand i think um because i'm not touring anymore i kind of semi-retired from that i'm just i'm a little bit burnt out from that lifestyle and so now it's, really it's, yeah well i noticed you weren't touring but I, I just assume that's covid because of covid even before covid it, it was maybe a year or two years before covid even huh yeah i'm so I'm very why would you do now. that i know why what no, I mean, with, <laughs> I mean, especially given that it's so easy for you. I mean, it's you and a tour manager, maybe you and a sound guy. I mean, it's, you could go and. It's not even that. It's just me. It, it's. It's. Well, I, well, I wish I had. I had more of a team, but uh, I just. I just. I like doing everything myself. Okay. Or, or, or like so just then, expanding. But here's the thing. What's stopping you from yeah. going and playing a gig in right. Stockholm and coming back? Yeah. Um. It's. It's the lifestyle. It's the the fantasy of like touring. People oftentimes have this fantasy of like, why well, I get to travel the world. You get to meet cool yeah. people. Everyone's yeah. always in a good mood. All of that. Yes. 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 But no one ever talks about the 23 hours that we're not playing yes. the show. That the, yes. the, the we're traveling. We're just waiting around. Sound check. Waiting for another three hours. When we're already amped up, we hear the sound in the stage. It's like this sounds yes. so good. I just want to play now. Mm -hmm. Got to wait three hours. We got to contain that energy. Wait. Just hold on to it for another three mm -hmm. hours. So not only that, but but it's just it, it, it can get lonely uh, being on the road, and and you lose your sense of home. And you know because I've traveled so much as a child, I feel like I was reliving certain right. elements of like. Right. You've just gotten grounded. The last exactly. thing you want to do is go right. back and travel. So and no, and this sounds it, it sounds like I did this, but I did it on purpose for so long because I wanted to go deeper into myself, into understanding. It's okay to travel. I shouldn't have fears of traveling because of what it's done in the mm. past. Of like this negative connotation, getting on a plane, you're never going to come back. Um, so I wanted to train myself, and I, I do that all the time with with things like um, things that I do to get out of my comfort zone. Like I don't know, once a month, I'll live on, on I'll live on poverty just just to test myself. Just to it's a very it's a very good grounding uh, experience, and it's a very humbling experience to do something like that. Wait, wait a minute. What, once a month? What yeah. are you talking about? What does that mean? I live on so, poverty. So once a month, I try to practice poverty. Okay. I'll, I'll what do just you do? live off of be. I'll eat beans. I'll I'll tr I'll try to spend like maybe a dollar. Two dollars for, for how the, long? For the whole day, just just for just one, one day, day. One just one day. day. It's uh -huh. it's not for long. But again, I, I do this because it's 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 it's. Well, it, very it sounded grounding. a little more impressive before I found <laughs> out that found this it. this important exercise is basically eating yeah. beans for one day. It's yeah. A, yeah. Well, it's it's not just that, but it's no no technology either. And, oh, okay. And, and okay. So so it's just just like what do you have? Because we're so used to having this device on us all the time that we, we forget like the little things that, what did we used to do before technology? Like I remember, know, read a book, I know. play an instrument, go for a walk, talk I to someone, right? I recently got like, I lock, locked out of my Instagram for a day right. and, I, <laughs> and I was like freaking out about it, you know? I was like, oh, I can't check my, yeah. and I thought, <laughs> What, I don't even care about it. Why, why do yeah. I even, you know, up until a couple of years ago, I wouldn't even care. Or yeah. I, I, it was the last thing I want, you know, and so now why, why do you it's care? derailing my day we, yeah. uh, because we get into those rituals yeah. and somehow I'm, I mean, part of it is that once these things become the communication method, mm -hmm. you know, you go, oh, it's somebody right. trying to get in touch with me and they can't, you know, but for the most part, it was stupid. I mean, yeah. I, you know, what do I care if my Instagram goes on for a day? It, what impact it. is it having on my life? Zero. Exactly. But I got exercised about it, yes. you know, so I, you know what I'm going to do? Once Delete a month, <laughs> well, well, I, no, I was going to be cheek, cheeky about yeah. it. I, I, no, once a month, poverty day. Beans? Yeah. yeah. No, I, no. no, let me ask you something. Can I eat as much beans as I want? Sure, right. yeah. It doesn't well, sound so bad, what, actually. What, what, I like what, beans. It's so. fine. But again, it's it's because like when you start, like back to your other question, I'll, I'll segue this into that because you were ta asking about why am I not touring anymore? Yes. Part of it is that, but then you're probably wondering, well, how am I making income? Right, because and, no, and, I kind of know how you're going to make it. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm going to get to that. <laughs> okay, I'm cool. going to get. I'm going to get to technology okay. too, because sure. you built quite an online footprint. But I'm really interested in that. You know, it's a curious decision for a guy who 
you seem ambitious. You put out these records. You've mm -hmm. got, uh, you know, you're very prolific online, and I'm going to get your YouTube channel mm -hmm. and your Instagram. We'll get to that. So, it, uh, you know, if I were your manager, mm -hmm. I'd be like, "Come on, let's, let's get on the it. road. Yeah. Let's make some money. Let's yeah. uh, build a fan base. Yeah. You know, you go to a new city. It's an mm -hmm. opportunity for press. Yeah. You know, you do some media. Yeah. More people find out about you." Mm -hmm. All, all true, all va yeah. valid points. But if, if I'm not aligned to that lifestyle, I, I can't force it. And mm -hmm. and just the last run, the last two years that I was doing it, I kept questioning on the train. I was like, what am I doing? Like this is, and, and I was reading a really good book called The Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss at mm -hmm. that point. Mm -hmm. I was really getting into self development, and and that's when I started to realize why am I even playing? Why am I playing the same set? Like over and over again. Like I've I've mastered this. I've mastered my set. I got my banter down. It's right, all pre written. Right. It's all the delivery is all good. And I was like, I'm not challenging myself. Right. And it's it's not just You're doing a Broadway musical. Exactly. You're just exactly. going through the motions. I'm going yeah, through yeah. the motions and yeah. I, I wasn't challenged. And, but it felt good on stage, but the 23 hours that I was not playing, I was like, what the hell? Like, I could be writing some crazy music right now at home, but I'm not going to do that because I need to save the What if somebody were with you? What if you toured with a percussionist? That would be cool. Because then that you have somebody to talk to, play off of. Yeah. You know, yeah, you're right. So share that, the stale cheese in the dressing exactly, room. You know. <laughs> exactly. That would be that would be a lot more interesting because then there would be a lot more impro improvisation yeah. and and off. But again, still, it's just it's being on the road. It, it's there's something about that lifestyle that that I've I've explored it. I've done right, it. I've right, gone to right. exotic places. I've met really cool people. I've done it. And I'm not saying that I'll never come back to it. I probably will at some point and, and be very selective towards it. But it's just at. And I, I questioned myself if I didn't have to make money off of touring because a lot of it was based off of that. There was a there was a transition point, the transitory phase where I was like questioning it. I'm not. I don't need to make. I don't need to make money from touring anymore. I don't mm. need to do this anymore. I need to do something bigger. And that's when I realized music, playing music, was the gateway into what I want to try to do right now, which is try to impact people and actually empower people through the music, through stories that I've been through, through adversity that other people have been through, and how they can cultivate that into their own art form. That, to me, is way more powerful than me just playing music for you and, and you And how listening. do you do that? It can, well, so, so a lot of my teaching right now, my teaching mm -hmm. style is very, it's almost like coaching in, in, in a mm -hmm. way. It's not just physically technical playing, but we're, we're breaking down barrier, barriers that people have about why they're not active, playing a specific way or um, habits that they have that, that, that is stunting their growth. So a lot of it is looking deeper into into the individual, and I love that. I love going deeper into 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 the why. Into let, let's just ask why, uh, you know, ten times or so, and see what is it that's actually preventing you from going in. And most of the time, it's either a story that you have written about yourself that you just you believe, and then when you bring awareness to it, like, oh wow, I've I've the reason I can't play like this is because of of this experience that I had, and I, I thought that experience it was just reinforced by by everyone around me. So, like, I want to break down barriers of, of people, and I want to I want to give them the sense that I have had from playing music, and it's it's brought a sense of peace in in my life. So, mm. I, I want others to experience that. Not just and you do that playing. through teaching. Yeah, get, get teaching the guitar. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, it it happened by accident. It's like it's starting to happen because I'm teaching a lot. More you teach of online. COVID. I exactly. should clarify. This yeah. is not somebody coming to a your home or no. a studio. Yeah. You, you've got these. It, like it's is it actually master class or it's like master class yeah, you do it's, these it's an online course it's yeah. an online course that you do yeah. and that's why I, you know when i saw you have a very active youtube channel mm -hmm. i mean you're active on social media in mm -hmm. general but uh, you have a lot of followers on instagram etc but mm -hmm. but to have that kind of a following on youtube um, I figure that is, and some of it's behind a paywall. Is that right? The people um, paid. The people pay to get the master class. Yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and what have you learned about who the people are that you're most inspiring? Um, it's it's people who are who hit a plateau. That that's you know, and a lot of people hit that, especially if you're self taught. I was self taught as well, so it's like. Uh, you need to do things something. You need you need to either do self development to break out of plateaus in your musical life because a lot of that is related to to you as an individual. It's not just about you're practicing the wrong things. It's the men mental state of how you're practicing, not of what you're practicing, and that makes a big difference. Oh, that's interesting. That makes a huge difference in in like into explosive growth versus very gradual growth. And people want explosive growth, obviously. I mean, when you're learning something, you want to grow quickly. Um, What's an example of how you're practicing versus what so, you're practicing? So, so if you're just practicing scales, mm -hmm. you, you'll be really good at playing scales, right? But that won't translate into music. 
So it's how you practice those scales in a musical context over chords, for example, just to give you a very technical example mm -hmm, of that, mm -hmm. that will lead to you being able to translate your emotions ultimately through the guitar. Because playing scales, it's like learning the vocabulary. Yeah, we learn the vocabulary first, and we form words, and we form paragraphs, and mm. we form expression and poetry at the end. Um, and it, that takes a long time to get to the point musically for someone to convey emotion through their instrument. Some people have that it factor, and they naturally do it. But a lot of it is either a gene that's dormant that we need to kind of like awaken or the environment around them, like full immersion, uh, uh, just through new music, new ways of harmonic structure and things like that, composition and things like this. That are they young them. people? No, are they they're boys? older. No. Who are they? Older. So I would say from 30 and up. Interesting. Yeah. I'm not, there's and are they no fans of yours? Yeah. Or Yeah. Yeah. I mean, is that why they're taking the lessons? Because they're fans of yours? Yeah. Yeah. So it's great because now I've done so much touring and, and like the grassroots kind of building the, the fan base. I'm not sure you should give up the touring. Uh, <laughs> do you want to be my manager? Well, <laughs> I, I, I mean, uh, you know, I'll be your coach. I, I just don't think you should give. I think that's yeah. a you got to keep cultivating. The, there's, there's people who are just discovering you. Yeah. You're right. You're right. But and, and I, I choose to do that through the online mediums right now. Just for now. Again, I'm, mm -hmm. like I said earlier, I'm not, it's not like I'm- Never I'm, say I'm never. Just, exactly. <laughs> Why weren't you allowed in the States for 10 years? So, yeah, because I was in- <laughs> What did I, you do? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't that bad. It's just that when we came to um, to Canada, we, my parents didn't claim our departure. I didn't realize this, but anyone listening, if you're ever getting deported from America, make sure you claim your departure for, for the, on the government website or whatever you claim it and then but we didn't claim do that where i don't i don't in know america yeah or, uh, so, so like, like tell somebody that exactly uh, oh i see government oh, official or, i see they didn't know you left they didn't know we left oh. so they thought i was still on, on american soil so when i tried to cross the border in buffalo they were like what are you doing on canadian soil we we have you here on our records you're on american soil you just broke the law we're going to give you 10 year uh, a bar. Wow. Be I'm like, what? Yeah. I'm just an innocent 18 year old. Like, what, what, to get what into do Buffalo I know? Yeah, exactly. Things, yeah. Well, not a purpose. I'm mean, just, just trying to <laughs> right, test. <right. laughs> but so, so you couldn't go to America for 10 years. 10 years. That's now expired. It's expired now. Yeah. But then I, I did get a, a waiver um, six years in, uh, which was a very tedious process. But eventually I, I was able to just come on a visit, one visit, and then come back. Some some of what you um, make musically, I want to ask you about your new record before mm -hmm. I let you go. But um, some of what you make musically is, is uh, I'm glad you said what you said about it's not just um, finger gymnastics. Mm. The music is is about a lot more than that, and and that you've learned that uh, you know you're. I, sometimes I relate these things to being a drummer, but mm -hmm. uh, I never think the best drummer is the guy who can do the fastest yeah. fill, even right. though that's what the audience cheers at. You mm -hmm. know, it's like, oh, yeah. what did he just do? You know, yeah. uh, it's the guy who's got the feel yes. or, the, or the woman who's exactly. playing with soul, you know, or yeah. knows how to back phrase while they're, while they're playing the drums. And uh, it's the same with you. I mean, where you're, uh, it, you know, I understand what you're saying. At the same time, you do do these tracks that are really just impressive. I wanted to play something from the 2016 record that's mm -hmm. called, uh, the album's called The Maradome Movement. Mm -hmm. Maradome is the, it's Farsi, right? People. The, the yeah, People's exactly. Movement. And the song is Daft Funk. Mm -hmm. yeah. What do you want to tell us about Daft Funk? Yeah, so I was very inspired by Daft Punk growing up, um, really inspired by their rhythm, by their rhythms. That's when I started getting into electronic music a little bit. I was maybe 16, 17, 18 or so. And then, yeah, so I just, I came up with this groove and I was, I was like listening to a lot of Daft Punk, even though the song sounds nothing like like Daft Punk no. whatsoever, but it's but it's, it's my homage. Friggin' to, cool! Yeah, it's this, a really yeah, fun, it's a fast, good piece. very technical and and groovy. So it, this this is a song that has not only the technical stuff, but also it's got groove and 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 uh, to me it's got feel as well. So um, it's it's a challenging piece, but it's it keeps me on my toes. You know, Take a time. listen to this because you'll never get to see it live because he's not touring. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> Take a listen. <laughs> Great piece. Thank you. Daft Funk. Mon Ali Jamal from the record The Maradome Movement from 2016. Mm. 
It's interesting you've got these Persian words in your titles. <laughs> I mean, I was wondering about you and I was thinking your name doesn't necessarily telegraph that you're Persian. Mm-hmm. Uh, That's true. And yeah. you don't, you speak, your your English is immaculate. There's no, mm. you know, I mean, I, I would have thought for a guy who couldn't speak English when he came <laughs> as a nine-year-old to America, there would be a little bit of, right. I think that, you know, yeah. but you've got nothing to that. Nothing. So, <laughs> <laughs> so do people know you're Iranian? No. Do I, Iranians know you're Iranian? I mean, if, if I've been on certain Persian shows and stuff, yes, but a lot of them either ask me, like, are you from Afghanistan? Or are you mixed? Hmm. And when I say I'm I'm full, they're like, really? Like three times. Like, and I say again, you know, yeah, really? Like, are you sure? It's like, yeah, I think I know my parents. Uh, so it's very interesting because they always they, they don't realize it because Manelli is a modern name, right? And it's it's usually used for females in in Iran, hmm. but it's a unisex name. That's what. I'm and Jamal telling. could be Pakistani Arab, Arab, or Arabic, exactly. or, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly, but my middle name is Sabzadi, so that's that maybe gives it away. <laughs> Sabzadi. So your audience isn't necessarily Iranians. In in the, say, I mean, how much of your online audience, for example, is in Iran? Uh, not very much. Not very much at all. I would say it's primarily North American um, and and Euro- European. You know, the basically. crazy part of that is What's that? Uh, Iranians love this music. Yeah, uh, you I'm know, surprised. Iranians <laughs> love acoustic guitar yeah. music. Right. Yeah, but I think they like more uh, like the nylon flamenco sound a yes, lot more true, than than, true. than the steel. They stuff. we're talking they, about. They, I mean, yeah, we, yeah, but exa- yeah, 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 exactly. exactly. <laughs> but 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 I would think that there would be a real audience for what you you do. I mean, you're so good. There's an audience mm-hmm. for you everywhere. But yeah. it's so interesting. I, mean, I was asking around a little bit. I know people who know you mm-hmm. or know of you. I mean, they're fans of yours, but they're not Iranian. And I don't mm. know a lot of Iranians who necessarily, I mean, yeah. we don't, you know, there's a certain circle of people that we trot out at our events as, yeah. as our, you know, <laughs> our famous Iranians, yes. and we don't talk about you yeah. necessarily. <laughs> Is that good? I, I, to be honest, I've never, um, it's not that I don't want to be associated with, because I still play, like, I play Tirgan, and I've done, like, yeah. like the Persian TV It's the wrong TV show shows. to be on. Yeah, if you don't want to be identified <laughs> yeah, as Iranian, right. That's it's true. Rook, you That's know? true. What does that even mean, Rook? Rook is, is Farsi for, like, candid. Oh, Rook, okay. Rook Budan, you know? oh, Okay, yeah. good. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> New word. Um, no, I just, I, I didn't culturally really relate to the Persian. I, I, I don't really, I'm, I'm not Persian. Like, even You're not? Though, I'd, I'd look at, but maybe even not even that. And both of your parents are. Both but, of my parents are, yeah. but it's like I've just I've been brought up in the Western world my yeah. whole life. I, I'm very Western. Yeah. Like my mentality is not Persian. Like you wouldn't even, date a Persian girl. I have, and uh-huh. and uh, it's 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 okay. Like no no discrimination. Reuse was it was she <laughs> Persian? She was Sp- uh, Spanish chef. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I, I, I'm I, obsessed <laughs> with her. Since I, I, I know tell. how to say her name. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ruiz. No, no sorry, Ruiz. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know. Yeah, exactly. No. um... I don't know. I've just I've never identified. Even though I have a lot of Persian friends, uh-huh. uh, ironically, but but it's like we always speak English, or if anything, we'll make fun of each fun of the Persian language, but just for kicks. Uh, um, but yeah, I didn't. I never really related to that culture. Like I, I do understand a lot of it, like the tarot and everything is. It's fun to do. I, I make fun of it as well. Again, uh-huh. over the top, uh, you know, hospitality and stuff. But it's 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 more from a comical point of view rather than like a, a serious point of view. So I don't know. I I just um, but. A lot of Persians know me because of those TV shows that I've been on, and mm-hmm. probably from this show as well. We'll probably get some more. Uh, yeah, you Uranus. definitely. Will. Yeah, which you is great. Will. Yeah, I mean, there's no discrimination against. Who's I mean, listening. you would have until you started dissing <laughs> the community. <laughs> yeah, <you know>? right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. What are your par- What's your parents' relationship with Iran these days? Um, I think it's very neutral. Um, but obviously, when what they've been through, they're they're cautious of it. My mom has been back several times. Oh, she and, has. Yeah, okay. no problems. But I think my dad is like big no. Uh, doesn't right. want to go back from. Or just that's not possible with what's going on, plus his age and everything. Um, but yeah, no, like they, they, they feel for it. They feel for Iran- Iranians a lot and, and for what's going on. And I think a lot of Iranians here are, you know, feeling of uh, what's going on there and how yeah. hard it is for a lot of people. And there's still a family there, of course. So it's, they, they see, they hear, hear about it all the time. Um, and I hear about it a lot too. And, and it's one of my dreams as well to want to go to Iran. I've never been mm-hmm. in a country where mm-hmm. all the people are your people. Mm-hmm. I think that'd be such a cool experience for me, right? musically, yeah. culturally, yeah. just to practice my Persian as well and to be made fun of all the time, which will be just a fun, lighthearted experience for a yes. lot of them too, yes. I think. But I, it's, I, and I, and I love being, I've, I've just, I have this fantasy of going to Iran and, and I know it's just fantasies mm-hmm. that I have that I'm, I'm Although not touring. 
you, yeah, you would actually, have to go there and not tour because you've you've you know I've announced that a ban yeah, on yeah, that. exactly. Yeah, yeah. But actually, I I would play there. I, okay, I, and I would do workshops and because I know that there isn't a lot of like this finger style Maybe, music there. Why don't you go? Uh, can you set it up? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. I don't. You could I don't know. I don't, I don't really know promoters there or or how right. that would go. There are people listening in okay. Iran right now, and there are definitely people listening who can help you get gigs in Iran and who live here, who are nice. promoters and yeah. whatever. You should totally yeah, go there. That, and play. That, that, they see, would love you. That I would do. Because Except that when you amazing. say, I'm not Persian, go to hell. I'm, not, <laughs> no, I, yeah, I'm yeah, a Canadian guy. I, I give up on yeah. this culture or whatever. But uh, no, I, I, I think... Honestly, there's a part of me that is missing. The part of my soul is, is longing for something. And that longing is to go to Iran, is to go to a country yeah. where my ancestors are from and, and where my parents are from. And so it's just, I know that I will, I will find a deeper appreciation for the country. I have no doubt about that. I just need to get get there. You know, once everything kind of cools down a little bit with the pandemic and everything and the economy, hopefully it will be okay. Um, I, I think going there will be such a blessing for me and I want to give back. Like I, I genuinely want to mm -hmm. help people, mm -hmm. especially with, with guitar because I know a lot of Iranians can't pay for like my master class and stuff. But if I was there to do like a and a and stuff, I would mm -hmm. love to break mm -hmm. down certain techniques for them and to, to empower them. As yeah. I was saying earlier, I think yeah. that'd be such a cool trip. Yeah, good on you, man. Yeah. Um, Tell me before I let you go. You're you've got a new baby coming out uh, <laughs> this month. Um, mm -hmm. uh, in fact, in a few days, called the Beauty of Flow. Yeah. Um, t tell tell us about it. Yeah. So this is a primarily a, a nylon CD with one steel string song. Um, very melodic bass. What, what does that mean? You, you usually use a steel string. Steel string. Yeah. It's guitars. it's it's a very it's more bright. Uh, it's good for percussion. Better for percussion, in my opinion. But uh, some might disagree. But yeah, nylon. Uh, primarily nylon guitar, usually two or three guitars as well. So all this stuff I can't play live. And this is one of the cool things about not touring is because now I can make music that I can do with multiple guitars and mm. not get pressure playing live. Like, hey, can you play that song? Can you play that song? Because I'll take requests before shows and stuff if people know I'm playing there. Um, so this stuff I can't ever play live, which is okay. And I like to move on. I like to create mm -hmm. compositions and you then can't just move on. or play the track or I, something? I could, but it just, I wouldn't feel... You wouldn't feel good. Feel right about... Yeah. So And the whole idea, the whole CD was written in, in the flow state. Um, mm. You familiar with, with the flow state? No. Uh, well, depends on what we're talking about. Okay. So there's Yoga there's actually, or, I mean, you know, uh, which yeah, flow? Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, it's a Hungarian-American guy who came up with with the term the flow state which mm. is basically doing an activity that's stimulating and just the right amount um, that is that you get lost time gets lost like time doesn't even exist at that point uh, and it's it's just stimulating enough that it's not anxiety inducing because if it's too challenging you're gonna give up mm. and if it's too easy you get bored so it's funny that that middle ground between not too anxious and not too too boring for you to experience, and then you get into the state of constantly being um, stimulated through through the act. What are, uh, athletes do it, um, musicians do it, and this whole album was actually written in that. So it was a very quick process for for this wow. whole album. Yeah. How do you get yourself into the flow state? Yeah. So usually it takes uh, for me it takes maybe twenty thirty minutes to get into that state, but once I'm in it, I, I, I get lost in it. Um, and so the way that you can do it is, again, you do certain things that are, that are for me, it's very explorative. So mm -hmm. as I'm being creative, I certainly, I look for voicings that I have never played before because that's challenging. Cause that's mm -hmm. like, Ooh, I'm thinking differently about it. Mm -hmm. That already is me engaging in activity. That's, that's more brain activity than, than I would normally use. Mm -hmm. And from there I keep doing that and exploring it. Eventually I start piecing two or three uh, ideas together and you keep doing that and it, it mm -hmm. compounds mm -hmm. through compounding. You start to get this like, okay, the, the whole song is, is written. It's already there. Mm -hmm. And then you do that uh, over the span of like two, three, a, m a month. I think most of it was written. And it in takes a like month. twenty-three minutes to get into that flow state. For, for me, you yeah. can get there faster by just smoking hash. I do that you, too. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you, it's a shortcut. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you really don't have the time. <laughs> yeah, just uh, <laughs> yeah. That that works too. <laughs> yeah. Um, man, it's a it's a really uh, uh, it's a nice pleasure to talk to you. And, Likewise. And a, yeah. um, uh, I really appreciate what you do musically. Mm. I'm so Thank glad you. that you came in. I really am excited about uh, if this is an introduction for folks out there. I know a lot of people already do know you, but mm. for those whom this is an introduction, uh, the music you make is inspiring and, and so interesting. And, and mm. I um, I do hope you can make it to Iran, and I do yeah, hope we see you. you performing and continuing to do what you do. I appreciate that. Thanks so much. Thanks for doing this. Uh, my pleasure. 
award-winning Iranian-Canadian guitarist and composer Monali Jamal. His brand new album is called Beauty of Flow. It comes out on July 16th. Monali Jamal, join me in the Rook studio today. taste of the brand new track beauty of flow the title track from the brand new album beauty of flow by monali jamal uh coming out on july 16th captain reza and groovy shy the microphone's back on kian has come back into the studio how about that monali he better tour i really want to see him live i know i I, I will not accept this (laughs) i don't get it when he says he doesn't want to tour he should he should he should really tour well, I, I mean, he, given how much he, I mean, we, we're calling him the nomadic guitar hero, yeah. given how much he's traveled in his life, you can <laughs> cut the guy a break for wanting to, <laughs> you know, feel he's grounded. Right. But uh, yeah, he should definitely tour, and I think he should go to Iran. I, I really like that he's playing with the the form. He's mm. mixing genres. He's not just, just sort of mimicking one thing, but yeah. really kind of, um, it's like an adventure to him. You see, you can hear where his fingers are going and from song to song, from album to album, is evolving in different ways. It's really nice to see somebody who's as accomplished as he is playing with the form like that. That's right. I mean, it's obvious that he's transformed. I mean, because his technique is amazing, you know, the way he, I mean, he's fast, he's clean. and Yeah. But uh, I, I like that. I feel he's transforming from being a, technical musician yeah. to a soul for yeah. musician. Yeah, which is what he's saying. He, yeah. It's not just about speed. It's not yeah, just about the wh- fingers going faster, yes. what, you know, uh, the, the kind of things that normally get people all excited. But uh, it's like drum fills or yes. something. You know, he's yeah. actually learning to uh, that it's about soul for him. And that's it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And what a story the guy has. Oh, oh, yeah, quite yeah. a story. I couldn't believe it. Getting kicked out of America like that. I, I, I can't even fathom like what he must have gone through. And when he said he, he felt like I was in prison, I was doing push-ups and just playing guitar, it really put it in perspective, man. Like, you can't fathom as somebody who's been through all the things you've been through? You no, can't fathom? no, no, but because I expected it and I wasn't a kid, you right, know? Right. It's for him to be a teenager, mm-hmm. a little kid. And, to and think he's found his place. Yeah, yeah. and, and then, then just get tossed We're getting around. kicked out, pick up your things, we're getting kicked out After of the country. After seven yeah. years, that's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And, and for me, ev- everything that happened to me was my choice. Nobody made that choice mm-hmm. for me. Right. And, 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 and I was at a certain age where I kind of knew what I was getting myself into. I wasn't expecting what was happening to me, but for him, like to, at such an age, to be to be a co- like literally countryless, yeah, to be kicked out of Keon's country to come <laughs> to Canada. Keon, <laughs> don't put this, this all on your me. People, I somehow, <laughs> I somehow wanted to insinuate you, President <laughs> Trump. It's all on Keon. Just put it on her. <laughs> it's all her fault. <laughs> Uh, but Thank it shows you. it shows yeah. the effects of nine eleven. Like it, these are all the stories that you know we that come out of that. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, back last year when we had uh, Banaf Sheikh Lari mm. on talking about yeah, how right. Middle Eastern people were targeted and she defends them as a lawyer in, uh, you know, in prison after the Patriot Act. Uh, this is another form now mm. of uh, this kid who has nothing to do with anything, let yeah. alone Iran had nothing to do with 9-11, right. getting, uh, you know, deported. Uh, I mean, it's uh, remarkable. Uh, it is. Uh, thank you, Mon Lee, for coming into the studio and um, can't wait to see you live as well. Um, it is Monday, and uh, well, that can only mean one thing. Letters of the week. So much passion. 
question in that <laughs> yes. one. Reza, this is the thing that Reza cares more about than anything I've seen. <laughs> more than thing. Rook, more than his acting We've career. We've a lot of people write about this too. It's like his thing. Yeah, it's, like, yeah, it's become <laughs> Reza's. Yeah. Yeah. Let's be your Instagram handle. Oh, oh be yeah. yeah, it's just an A and a bunch of A. Uh, all right. So last week on episode uh, 122, we had Iranian American neurologist Dr. Shahin Nuri on the show. He's uh, sadly suffering from a rare and aggressive form of lymphoma, and his only hope of survival is a stem cell transplant from a from the blood of a healthy, compatible donor. Which is like, ironically, it's it's only it can only be an Iranian. So. Um, he discussed the importance of uh, stem cell donation, especially in the Iranian diaspora, since there's such a s- shortage of um, of Middle Eastern people. Right. In the yeah. So to clarify, right, it's it's not only an Iranian, right. but it's right. most likely to be somebody that That's right. you share ethnicity with, and, That's and right. so most likely to be an Iranian. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, so we have Al, King of Persia, wrote to us saying, "Thank you, Jianjian, for emphasizing such an important matter. Shaheen is such an amazing and kind fighter." Shaheen is such an amazing and kind fighter. We should all be proud of his campaign. Thank you to the Rook team. Thank you for that, Al. And, and uh, we all hope that we can make a difference with last week's uh, episode. We all encourage you to listen to it and to uh, listen to Shaheen's story and, and to follow his the links to how you can help in general, not just him, but this situation of um, stem cell supply for Iranians. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then we have Ziba, last name listed as B says, thank you, Jian. I became your fan with Q, and now I love your Rook show. Another fantastic interview. Thank you so much for spreading the word and helping us with this campaign. I just wanted to add that once registered, you're in the system for a longer period than just five years. In Canada, once you're registered, you're in the system until the age of 60. Oh. See, I didn't know that. I thought it was the limit of five years. So, yeah, oh. it's, apparently it's yeah, good to know. Good to know, yeah. Yeah. And then we have a Nick Sam wrote, we're going to do this test in Toronto, Canada as a family. Nice. That's amazing. That is amazing. Thank you, Nick, for doing that. And this is the stem cell test, which I, a couple of you guys have done. Yeah, right? that's right. right. Myself yeah. and Reza, I believe. Yeah. It, it's a very yeah. quick test. And um, like like Nick Sam said, you're you're in the system until age 60. So it's great. Right. And then we have Atefe Tabish wrote, I was a stem cell donor in the summer of 2014. I'm very healthy and my recipient is now happy and healthy as well. Such a rewarding act. I urge everyone to register and become a donor. Wow. Way to go, Atefe John. That's really great. Yeah. And then we have Jeyron Iskandadi wrote, The beginning of the episode made me think of the Iranian version of Independence Day. I would go for the 29th day of Isfand. What does that mean? Uh, Shaya, it's actually know? it's the Ruze Melli Shodan San Atanaft. It means that the day that the oil industry became a uh, national. Oh, oh. Yeah. okay. It's the 29th of Esfand? Yes. Hmm. That's different from Esfand, 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 Sadasidan. Harkas in Shaya Junimana. Yeah. And. Oh, nice. I don't even know what that means. Oh, uh, Have next, you never done that? You've done the S fan. My mom does it oh, all yeah. the time. I just uh, yeah, I go with it. <laughs> what do you say? What do you say? Yeah. We know chess better. Chess better. Chess much better than it. I have tried, of course. That's to be chess. Uh, it's so funny. It's like a form of witchcraft. <laughs> <laughs> The non, right. non-Iranians listening have tuned out. <laughs> We're uh, staying away from these people with their <laughs> rituals. <laughs> cool. And then we have a Omid Ferdosi. Just some background. He wrote to us on a previous episode with uh, Sahar. Um, what's her name? Sahar. The comedian. Sa- yeah, Golshani. Uh, he wasn't a fan of that episode. And I, I guess you made a comment uh, about his name saying it's the opposite of being oh, Omid oh, Ferdosi. Right, right, right. <laughs> so he wrote, I had no choice in my name. This was a really good interview, though. You do a really good job asking questions and letting the interviewee answer. Got introduced to y'all through your interview with Nima Naziri. Keep crushing it. Nice. Thanks, Omid. Thanks, Omid. Or y'all. <laughs> uh, all right. Then we have Farnaz S. wrote, Dear Rook team, I'm 48, but I shared this with all my friends and family members in WhatsApp and the Everything About Toronto Facebook page as well as my Facebook page. 
I hope we spread the word and a donor steps forward and is the right match. Now, the reason that Farnaz is saying I'm 48 is because for Shaheen in particular, mm-hmm. the donor needs to be between the age of uh, 18 and 44 to or something like that. 35, I thought. 35 in Canada. 35. Like oh, 44 in, Canada, in yes. America, yeah. Yes, that's right. Uh, so there's some distinctions around mm-hmm. it, but I, obviously it's still good to offer your blood or, or stem cell be a donor no matter what the age I guess that's right and then we have Turaj Khosravi wrote thank you guys for the wonderful show it still makes me laugh when I remember the recent story about the epic cat battle between the Persians and the Egyptians lol and this is a, <laughs> a previous segment of uh, It's All Persian to Us where, where I brought up the fact that there was a cat army that the yeah. Persians <laughs> used yes. to fight the, the Egyptians true story by the yeah, way okay, yeah. uh, he goes on saying wonderful piece of history Princess Kiondo oh. it's because my name means princess but anyway right. um, I have a question and would like to know how a letter or message can gain all the rook points and become the letter of the week big hugs from Ireland yes princess Kiondo <laughs> how, how does something become <laughs> the letter no, of the week <laughs> there's no set rules really but it's it's a it's the letter that catches the eye that stands out mm-hmm. amongst the masses and, and whose eye does it need to catch uh, mainly just mine yes because I am the princess <laughs> well kidding. this guy was on your side with the cat battle so. and he well, still didn't get the, actually, letter I, of the week. I, this guy's I, trying everything I mean <laughs> dear princess I love you uh, your feet you're the best I you know uh, no, practically he's like you what know, am I, I supposed to do to I was I was going to give him the letter of the week until I received the best like I mean oh, this oh, this one's good this week's letter of the week but to be is clear like, people don't need to mention that you uh, no they the do not too, to Raj, yeah. you don't need to put Hinduna under yeah, my yeah, bag yeah, is that yeah, the yeah, saying yeah, <laughs> put watermelon <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> compliments to Gian win points too by the way he, he gets a say in it as well I just veto them sometimes Gene <laughs> All right, Jane. All right. As well, last week on episode one, two, three. Yeah, I like that. We had renowned scientist Dr. Reza Moridi on the show. He was actually the first ever politician of Iranian descent elected to any legislature in Canada and the U.S. Uh, so on that episode, we have a Sam Madoshi who wrote to us saying, it's often said amongst the community that the biggest problem of the Iranian opposition is the lack of a leader. Is that really true? Sam Marashi. Oh, Bevakshi. Sam no Marashi. Yeah. But does Thank anybody you. have an uh, answer to his question? <laughs> I think. <laughs> well, so. well, it's a hypothetical question, yeah. but uh, yeah, that is the biggest problem yeah, with the Iranian so. opposition. That's Who's right. the leader? Yeah. Other right. than Captain Reza. <laughs> God help know. us all if he's ever the leader. Thanks. Hey guys, come on, let's make a revolution. Oh, be on. Oh, be on. Let's go, baby. And then we have Par Par Adab wrote, I admire Dr. Moradi. He's a role model for young Iranians to be involved in politics. He's always spoke about the injustice in Iran and was never afraid to raise his voice. His strength after losing his son is remarkable. Thank you, Dr. Moradi. Truth. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. For that letter. All right, it's time for the letter of the week. Oh yeah! Yes. Okay. Yes, so, baby. who was it? It was um, uh, what was his name? Turaj Khosravi. You asked earlier, what you know? How do you get the letter of the week? Let, this is like a prime example of how you can All get right. the letter. This of the is week. the kind of standard it needs to mind. be. Everybody, guys, keep in mind. It's it's very hard to you know. We put a lot mm-hmm. of work goes into putting out these episodes every week. A lot of late hours and just blood, sweat, and tears. So when we get letters like this, you're talking about the rest of us, right? <laughs> Not you. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I'm playing Showing tennis. Up, yeah, show, yeah. 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 shows <laughs> up, get, gets a manicure, and then yeah, we'll come to the. <laughs> hey. <laughs> I can't, no, really, I can't. it's it's uh, it's there's a whole team behind these episodes. Yes. So when we get letters like this, it really just means so much, and it reminds us why we do what we Thank do. Thank you for saying that. So. That's absolutely true. That That's right. these are the letters like I that keep. I, I think all of us yeah. uh, That's right. really inspired. You know, for to sure. especially when they're from different parts of the yeah. world. So this week's letter of the week goes to a Tahmine Kamza, uh, Tammy in brackets. She has so she writes, "Hello to my beautiful Rook team." I listen to you every day while driving to work and back. I've learned so much about our culture and have been inspired by many. I've laughed a lot and shed some tears. I dreamt about being rich and helping Aghay Robadi with his dreams. So I reached out to him and thanked him. And guess what, Reza? He personally responded to me, lol. (laughs) throwing shades at me. I talked to every one of my Canadian clients about our female wrestling champion. I made a new Tadik dish 
and got a new blouse from La Femme Rouge. I fell in love with our previous king and cried for his pain. I watched Raya the, and the Last Dragon with a new sense of pride. And it's all thanks to you guys for doing what you do. Love you, my beautiful Rook team. And Gian, I'm so glad your voice is part of my daily routine again. Wow. Beautiful letter. That's a letter. That is of a the, good letter. That's a letter yeah. of the week, yeah. I'd say. Yeah. Thank you, Tahmine, Tammy. Uh, thank you, Princess Kian Ducht. <laughs> thank you, Captain Reza and Groovy Shaya. This is full time for Rook for today. For all things Rook related, our website, rookmedia.com, is where you go. Rookmedia.com, where you can also become a patron. Thank you again to Farid Ameriun and York National Realty, yorknational.com, for helping us out with this episode of Rook. Thanks to the amazing team who put this show together. Ponta the artist, Thoughtful Nagin, the fabulous Keon, producer Susan, Super Patty Saw, Savvy Roham, Ahai Mertad, sponsorship Sean, Captain Reza, and Groovy Shaya. Thank you to all of you out there supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe on any of our platforms if you've not done so already. It is free to subscribe. And you can find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi. Thanks again, everybody. See you Thursday. Mizun Bashi. Bye.